This video is sponsored by NOAA, an app I use for listening to articles from the world's leading financial publishers. Stay tuned until the end of the video for a special six month free offer for their service. In 1958, a New Zealand economist by the name of A. William Phillips proposed a new model for better understanding inflation that would go on to shape monetary and fiscal policy for years to come, the Phillips curve. The theory stated that price inflation and unemployment were two inversely related opposing forces. When one was high, the other would be low. The thinking was that scarce labor from low unemployment would cause wages and subsequently prices for goods and services to rise, while high unemployment would conversely slow down economic activity and thereby cool price inflation. The model was a solid framework that gave countries a tool for optimizing economic activity. And yet, come the 1970s, it faced an existential crisis. The United States entered a period that dumbfounded economists, experiencing roughly a decade of both high unemployment and high inflation, giving rise to a market phenomenon that strikes fear in the heart of central bankers to this day. Stagflation. Well, not the most creative villain name given that it's quite literally just the combination of the words stagnant and inflation, stagflation is still an incredibly tricky situation to beat. And with some seen parallels between the current market environment and the 1970s, some fear that just like Palpatine in the new movies, we would see stagflation's vengeful return. And as with both situations, we'd rather not. So what exactly is stagflation? What causes it? And how do our current circumstances measure up to the dreadful period within the 70s? We'll answer those questions and more on today's Plain Bagel. Stakeflation is a bit of a weird term because there's no technical definition for what constitutes stakeflation. But broadly speaking, it refers to when the economy sees rapidly rising prices, slowing economic output, and high unemployment. This is technically different from a recession. We'll both generally describe tough economic conditions, a recession is when the economy actually contracts, typically for two consecutive quarters. With stagflation, that's not necessarily the case. The economy may actually continue to expand, but it will generally do so at a very slow or flat rate, which makes the rapidly rising prices that are occurring at the same time fairly painful for businesses and consumers. Even though the economy is growing slowly, prices are expanding at a faster click, then business activity and the high unemployment can possibly compensate for. On top of this, while recessions are generally considered a natural, if not healthy part of economic cycles, stagflation is a much more abnormal and rare occurrence. So what causes this peculiar phenomenon? Well, generally speaking, there are thought to be two ingredients, if you will, for periods of stagflation, supply shocks and economic policy errors. Supply shocks refer to any exogenous force that disrupts the supply side of the economy. The force can cause the supply of goods to fall, which increases their scarcity and can cause prices to rise. Supply shocks can be caused by anything from a natural disaster to war to geopolitical issues. And when they impact important commodities like crops, metals, or oil, it can cause broad-based inflation, given that these materials are inputs to a great many number of goods and services. In 1973, the US was subject to an oil embargo imposed by Arab members of OPEC for the country's support of Israel during the Yom Kippur War, which caused the price of oil to quadruple, with it rising even further towards the 80s. You can see how this would constitute a pretty hefty supply shock. But again, that's just half of the supposed equation. The second point, economic policy errors, refers to any disruptive policies from the government that's combined with a rapid increase in money supply. Disruptive policies can include anything from excess taxes to price controls to really any sort of regulation or action that would hamper profitability or productivity by meaningful amount within a space. Meanwhile, central banks pursuing expansionary policy during a time when prices have already increased can thereby exacerbate the inflation that's already being experienced without much of a boost to the underlying economic activity, as was the case within the 70s. Leading up to the crisis, the Federal Reserve had maintained low interest rates despite a booming decade over the 60s, causing inflation to take off when the supply shock hit the economy. Part of the problem too is that inflation in and of itself is pretty hard to cool down. Even if supply shocks do subside, rising prices have a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy aspect to them. As consumers, businesses, and investors come to expect prices to rise, they adjust their behaviors accordingly. 
demanding mm -hmm. higher wages, hiking prices, whatever have you. But in doing so, they can actually help ensure that inflation will continue. Now, an observant few might be asking, Richard, are you sure describing the 1970s and not like right now? After all, we are currently seeing high inflation after over a decade of monetary stimulus at a time where oil is seeing a supply side shock. Well, that's exactly the concern and why stagflation is starting to circulate headlines again. 2022 has demonstrated troubling similarities to the 1970s, which could spell bad news given how difficult stagflation was to deal with back then. You see, even though the phenomenon itself sort of violates the Phillips curve relationship, policymakers still face that trade-off between inflation and unemployment, or by a larger extent economic activity, when trying to pull the economy out of stagflation. They can try to deal with inflation by raising interest rates, which will contract money supply and discourage spending, but in doing so, they'll slow down or contract an already slow economy. Alternatively, they can try to deal with the low economic output by cutting interest rates and stimulating the economy. But this can cause inflationary spiral and push prices higher still. It's really a lose-lose. Clearly, the best approach here is to try to ensure that the stagflation never happens. But how do you get off this crazy ride once it's already begun? Well, as the 1970s showed us, it's quite difficult to try and grow out of the stagflation, given that inflation tends to overcompensate for additional stimulus that's intended to try to restart the economy. It's actually part of the reason stagflation lasted so long in the US during the 70s. Policymakers enacted stimulus to try and get the economy out of its slump, but in doing so kept inflation at its elevated level. The period only really ended once the US hiked its own interest rates to close to 20% essentially shocking the system to finally get inflation under control. Now, the rate hike did bring on a painful recession, but as I say, drastic times call for drastic measures. And it's why as we experience similar factors today, some are concerned. With the Federal Reserve seemingly keen to prove that it's serious about reigning in inflation and interest rates far from that 20% level that was needed to end stagflation back in the day, many are expecting tough times ahead. But while we've gone over the similarities between the 1970s and 2022, we should highlight the material differences that exist as well. Because as scary as these times may be, it is important to understand how our current situation does in some ways put us in a better spot than where the US was in 1973, at the onset of its stagflation. For one, compared to the 70s, the US dollar is a lot stronger and the economy much less dependent on oil. According to Horizon Investments, it currently takes 0.43 barrels of oil to produce $1,000 of global GDP, compared to one full barrel back in 1973, meaning the oil intensity of the global economy has dropped 57% since the 70s. So while oil remains an important commodity for business activity, our dependence on it has fallen over time. Secondly, as painful as filling up a full tank of gas has become in 2022, the jump in oil prices that we've seen so far is still much smaller than what we had during the 70s. In fact, while the price of oil is almost double from where it was pre-pandemic, it's actually only marginally higher than where it was in 2014. Compare that to prices more than tripling early on during the stagflation period, and we're far from experiencing 70s-like conditions. Thirdly, while any type of inflation is clearly painful for consumers, when you look at the basket of goods purchased by the average consumer in the 70s versus today in the breakdown of the different categories, you can see that consumers back in the 70s were much more vulnerable. Fuel and electricity have come to represent a smaller share of household budgets, while disposable income dedicated to debt payments has likewise fallen. Again, it's not to say that inflation won't matter for households, it's just to say that household budgets have improved and become more resilient when compared to the 70s. And yes, I know a lot of retail traders and possibly even viewers are not the biggest fan of central banks. It's not to say it's totally without cause. But the final big reason why 2022 does differ from the 70s is that central banks have developed a better reputation for controlling inflation than they had back in the day. In truth, economics is a very rough and obscure science, if you can even call it that. But banks do have the benefit of hindsight to see how things have gone wrong in the past and to try and avoid those same problems from recurring. It's not to say that they always do a good job, but they have a longer track record for keeping inflation low than they had back in the 70s. And markets do appear to believe that central banks will pursue aggressive rate hikes to bring inflation under control. Indeed, this could prompt a recession. 
but the actions should help stave off a period of stagflation. And experiencing a slowdown or recession in the short term, given that recessions generally last under a year, certainly beats experiencing a decade of stagflation, only to need to bring on a recession anyway to dig the economy back out. Now, some might suggest that we're already in a period of stagflation and we just don't know it yet because the numbers have yet to reflect it. Sure, that could be the case. But remember, we've so far only really seen the one aspect of stagflation, inflation. Unemployment remains very low in North America. And while yes, that could of course change, hiking rates to tackle inflation before unemployment deteriorates, again, should help avoid a worst case scenario. Now, none of this is to claim that it's smooth sailing ahead. The risks of a recession are high. And unfortunately, developing countries are likely to experience particular hardship given that they are much less equipped for managing through rate hikes from the US. There are also many hurdles ahead in terms of addressing the root causes of these inflationary pressures, and there's no telling how long it will take before we return to a more sustainable level of normal activity. And of course, many households will suffer along the way. Still, claims that we're already in a period of stagflation or bound to repeat the mistakes of the devastating 70s because of surface level similarities are misleading at best. And hopefully, just like the bell bottom jeans and corduroy suits of the time, stagflation stays in the past. This video is sponsored by NOAA, and thanks to their partnership, I come bearing an awesome, exclusive, limited time, free six month offer for their service if anyone's interested in further understanding finance and economics. If you aren't aware, NOAA is an app that narrates business articles from the likes of Bloomberg, The Economist, and Harvard Business Review. These are some of the best publishers in the space, and most of their articles are actually pay-gated. So NOAA not just lets you listen to these articles, but it actually gives you access to a lot of stuff you otherwise wouldn't be able to see. On top of this, NOAA uses a team of industry experts to curate article series so that you can look up a topic of interest and then get more than one perspective on it. For example, I actually use them to help research for this video. I found their series, Is This a Return of Stakeflation, incredibly useful, and you'll see that I took some of my data points from the articles that were cited. And overall, the playlist did a really good job of explaining why the past isn't the best reference point for figuring out what our current situation is going to play out like. It's a really cool service. And for the next seven days only, you can use the link in the description below for a free six month subscription to their premium membership with regular pricing thereafter. So if you're interested in getting that expert coverage of the news, I highly recommend you take advantage of it and check out NOAA. Thanks for watching. I hope you found the video helpful. If you did, please do make sure to like, subscribe, and all that good stuff. It does help the channel tremendously. And let me know your thoughts down below what you think of stagflation. Are you an optimist? Do you think we'll get through this fairly painlessly? Or are you a pessimist who thinks we're in for 10 years more of pain? As always, <laughs> thanks for joining me. We'll see you in the next one.